Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. And thanks, for everybody, for coming. Sounds like we're all in similar time zones, or at least most of us, which, which is great. Uh, my name is Clint Carlson. I'm in Istanbul, Turkey. I'm the Director of Education Technology person at the Istanbul International Community School here in Turkey. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, which is uh, can be a heavy, dense, deep topic. But this is going to be a nice intro to this, uh, which not only introduces some of the topics and languages about AI, but also gives us a project that we're going to be working on together, uh, two projects that we're going to be working on together in this session, and hopefully some brainstorming on how you could turn this into a lesson for your students. So let's jump into my presentation. All right, everybody, okay. seeing my, everybody see yep. my deck? We see it. Uh, I think so, right? Yeah, we We're, see you. Cool. Good. All right. Uh, I'm not going to put it in presentation mode because I'm going to be jumping back and forth between a couple of tabs. Uh, but I think we'll be fine. I'm not here to read all of these slides to you anyway. Uh, but here we go. So our agenda for this evening is a brief overview of what machine learning is. How is it different than artificial intelligence? Uh, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on it once we get back to a little bit of vocabulary because then we're going to be creating our own machine learning projects. Uh, no hardware, no software needed besides the laptop that you're using right now. Uh, we're going to talk about how this technology might be used for others and to help other people, especially now during our socially distanced period of our lives. Uh, then we're going to talk about how students could recreate this type of projects and maybe connect it to some humanitarian efforts, which could be in real time or could be focused on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals or whatever else happens to pop into your mind as we work through this. Uh, hopefully we'll have some brainstorming conversations throughout this uh, topic so that we can talk and bounce some ideas off of each other. Uh, because it'd really be great to see if there are ways for us to introduce machine learning into our students' lives uh, right now while we're all working from a distance. Uh, your outcomes, uh, you're going to understand the concept of machine learning, ML, and how it connects artificial intelligence. You're going to create your own utensil or fruit detector that can identify different objects from your kitchen. And you will have brainstormed how to introduce this project to your distance learning students. So let's get the gobbledygook out of the way. What is machine learning? So this is the process of teaching a software system how to make accurate predictions when fed data. So thinking of this as almost like a spreadsheet on hyper hyper steroids. So we can use a spreadsheet and organize all of our data and turn that data into information or we can do that in a variety of ways, but we're gonna do that through machine learning which actually has the device itself figuring out and learning as it goes. Uh, because it's going to be learning from the experiences that we're going to feed into our machine learning project as we go. Uh, if that doesn't make any sense, don't worry about it. In five minutes, you're gonna be making your own machine learning project and it'll clear this up. Uh, just to say it, there are a couple of approaches to machine learning and machine learning being part of artificial intelligence. It kind of is a staggered effect. Uh, there are three ways. Uh, one is supervised learning where humans are giving the rules to the machine learning project. And that's what we're going to be doing today. But there's also unsupervised learning uh, where machine learning is given data with no instructions and it finds its own structure on its own. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting YouTube videos of this working and not working. Uh, there's a great example where they, they create this worm and the worm is told, all right, you need to reach this endpoint of this maze as fast as possible. And without giving it any rules, without giving any supervision, the worm stands up on its back legs and falls over on top of the maze and reaches the endpoint, completely breaking how you navigate a maze. But without giving any of that instruction or instruction for that uh, machine learning to do anything different, it found the path of least resistance. And then we've got uh, reinforcement approaches, which is a little bit more intense. This is where self-driving cars and Google Translate are, are constantly improving and working in real time based on, the, uh, based on what's working and not working in their real-time environment. You're not going to be doing that today. We're going to be doing supervised learning. So let's jump right into it. So everyone's got three minutes. Run into your kitchen, grab three objects. It can be three pieces of fruit. I'm going to be doing this with a 
apple, orange, and banana. Interesting because these are two round objects that it's going to have to know the difference between. But you can do this with a spoon, fork, knife, any three objects you want. It makes sense for them to kind of be similar. Like mine are all fruits or all utensils, uh, but whatever you like. So I'll see you back here in three minutes and we'll be ready to go. Everyone back? Looks like it, except for Steven. He's gonna go grab his fruit. Uh, while we're waiting for Steven, uh, the website we're gonna be using for this is called teachablemachine.withgoogle.com. I put a link of it in the chat of this, uh, of this session that we're in. So you can click on it there or you can just uh, type it into your browser. Of course, you won't be able to click this link on my presentation. And that will take you here teachable machine with google.com and the teachable machine project is sort of a web friendly version of tensorflow which is a very high end artificial intelligence framework that google has created uh, is everybody here Let me check one more time looks like we're all here great so when you go to teachable machine dot with google.com you're at a page like this and yet you could jump right in and get started but we're not going to use this version of teachable machine <laughs> so this is a the 2.0 version of Teachable Machine, which is much more powerful in how it uh, recognizes images, sounds, and poses, which we're going to get to later. But we first want this to be able to give us feedback at the end, which the new version of Teachable Machine doesn't do. So if we scroll down just a little bit to this what is Teachable Machine, we can see a link that there's a link to the first version of Teachable Machine from 2017 here. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to be using tonight. So that should take you to teachablemachine.withgoogle slash v1. This is an experiment. Oh, sorry. Let's you explore. Got excited. <laughs> Got excited. Absolutely. Uh, anybody not up to speed? Give me a thumbs down. Cool. All right. I don't want to outpace anybody. So we're going to skip the tutorial and we're going to go right into Let's Go. I'm going to give you five minutes to create this after I create it. So don't feel like you need to do this along with me. Uh, just just watch for a few seconds and you'll see how it works and then you're going to have time to create your own and share with the rest of the group. So I'm going to click on let's go and this interface gives me, I'm going to skip the tutorial down here, gives me input which is coming from my video so you might need to allow your browser tab to allow for camera and microphone. It's got an output which we're going to set as speech but it could be images, it could be sound effects, it could be a variety of things and we've got three examples that we're going to train. So one of these is going to be for the apple, one of these is going to be for the banana, and one of these is going to be for the orange. So let's go with my apple first. So here's my apple in this screen. And anytime that I'm holding down the training button, I want to make sure I have the apple in the frame. It can be anywhere in the frame, because again, we want to teach this machine to know what an apple looks like, no matter what angle, no matter how far away, no matter how close. So we're just holding down training, and it is collecting many, many different examples of what an apple looks like. And I give it to about 100 examples. We'll be strong enough to, to get this going. And we're almost there. So I'm just moving it around, rotating it. Hello. And there we go. So now, uh, nothing else is trained. So we'll leave that apple to the side. My next one, I'm going to use my banana to train the, the purple section of this. And again, just holding down that training button, and it is collecting snapshots of every image that has this banana from every weird little angle and color and shape. Got about awesome. 100 there. And my last one. Awesome. Is Hello. <laughs> Hello. Awesome. Let me mute. Oh, it isn't. Help. Awesome. All right. We'll put it here for a second. <laughs> Back to my orange because I still need to train my third one, which you'll notice is the same shape and size as my apple. So this is going to have to be intelligent enough to know that these are not a banana, but what is the difference? And it's going to have to be color. So I'm going to get my orange in the screen, hold down my orange, rotate it around, let the light bounce off it from forever, from all over the place, hold it in the back, hold it up close. We're coming up on 100. Looks great. All right, so now I've trained, and of course, if we do more examples, if I trained uh, another hundred of my apple, it would get even stronger. Uh, but before we test it, let's awesome. add in our outputs. So I'm going to yes. go into speech, and I'm just going to have it identify the object that I hold up to the screen. 
your own. And now let's give it a quick test. So I'm holding in my apple. apple. And it's 99% sure that's an apple. Awesome. Orange. And an orange. And banana. Banana. So immediately it's crushing it. Orange. And immediately it knows the difference between apple. these two objects. If I hold them both up, its confidence isn't apple. so high. It's confused. So now it's not. Orange. Or orange. <laughs> so let me make sure I covered all my points. So make sure the website can access your camera. Hold down the training button. Don't sit there and try to tap it for each individual click. Just hold down training and move your object around. Uh, bunch of different directions, get at least a hundred. Uh, this is, it's really collecting data, a hundred data points of what an apple looks like. So I will give you, uh, I don't know, five minutes to do this on your own. Make sure you've got your mic muted and we'll come back and see if anybody's got one that's interesting that they want to share. Maybe something different than fruit, maybe uh, silverware or, or something else that they've got. Uh, so take a few minutes and then we'll uh, group back once you're caught up. And I'm here if you've got any questions in the next couple of minutes while everyone's working. And I get to watch all of you hold up random spoons in front of your cameras. <laughs> Do need some background music. You're just gonna have to start singing, Clint. <laughs> Bad idea. Everyone looks like the Matrix. There is no spoon. <laughs> So Steven, is this set up so that other people can share their screens or is it just me? I think your microphone is muted. That would be helpful. Um, Anyone can. Right now it's one participant at a time. Okay. Oh, I was waiting to see if anyone is holding up anything else and now I see a lemon. So I think we're almost done. All right, is anybody finished and want to share their project with the group? Someone wants to give you an apple. <laughs> Kate wants to give you an apple. Apple for the teacher. <laughs> Who's volunteering? Simon, that means it's you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm having issues with my camera working within uh, the program, so I'm going to go get another uh, computer. Mm, okay. Sure. Okay. And you actually, obviously, you can see me. Oh, I haven't got there yet. Nice. Had a little bit of issue with the fork. I had to do that again. Sure. I mean, sometimes uh, you've got two objects and they can look very, very similar, mm -hmm. like a, a fork and a knife can from a lot of angles. And, and they're also all the same, all silver. So right. that would have... Um, so, so more, more training will continue to build your artificial intelligence's confidence mm -hmm. about what it's looking at, which is fantastic. Anybody else uh, want to share? All right. Well, let's move on a bit. Unless uh, anybody wants us to wait. I don't see anybody holding objects up to the screen. I'm assuming that we're <laughs> all caught up. Okay. Well, congratulations. You've trained your first maybe uh, machine learning algorithm to tell the difference between many different things. Uh, so let's jump into what it means to look at the machine, Teachable Machine 2.0. And again, you don't have to uh, follow along. I will just show you uh, that this is the version 2.0 of this. And the, the powerful part of it is, is one, it does more than just images. It also can detect audio, uh, different sound effects, different noises, uh, but also poses. 
So you could create uh, where you hold your hands out and it, it'll trigger something. Uh, the real power of it is that anything created in the 2.0 version of it can be exported as a TensorFlow uh, library. So you really are creating uh, proper artificial intelligence projects uh, that can be uh, wired into other platforms and other APIs and control things. Uh, things like uh, setting up a Raspberry Pi to be able to detect when a piece of fruit is rotten and then push that to the side and keep the good fruit on the, on the other side. Uh, things like that are very, very possible, just a little bit more than we're going to be doing here today. Uh, so looking at that, we've got things like this audio project and it works very, very similar. It just doesn't have the output at the end. Uh, but we'd be training that exactly the same way. So we could have a background noise. Clint, can you share your screen? Are you doing that? Oh, am I not doing that? Uh, no. Oh, <laughs> sorry, you guys. I thought I was uh, sharing my screen this whole time. Let me hop back in. How's this? Yep, good. Good. All right. So I'm at my teachable machine area, and um, what do I do? Backtrack. So I went in to get get started, and I'm going to do the audio project just to see this is a little bit different, and it's asking to look at these two different things. So we're going to do background noise, and don't talk for the next twenty seconds. So now it has the, the data of what the ambient sound in your uh, apartments or wherever you are sounds like. And then we're gonna create a second example. And that looks pretty good. I could edit it down a little bit. Uh, I think I will, but that's pretty decent. And, oh, I didn't get enough background noise. Let me try that one more time. Okay, so now I've got a data sample of 20 seconds of background music and a, a different audio sound, which is my clapping. And I can try, it's still giving me trouble. Well, I think you get the gist of it because you guys are all going to be working on your own uh, independent uh, Teachable Machine 2.0 project with either audio or posing. So let me give you a quick show of what the posing would look like. So we're going to add posing examples. And again, this is camera. So I'm going to hold one hand up and sample what that pose looks like. And you can see the outline. It's drawing sort of a skeleton, trying to understand my movement and, and the shape of my body and my arm holding up. So I can do that for the left side, and then I could do another one for the right side and have it detect is my left hand up or is my right hand up. And then it's up to you to be thinking about, well, what would I want that to trigger? And, and what good could that do? And one thing that one of my students came up with was, and I'll show you another example in a little bit, but a good example with the pose machine was that it allowed people that were in hospital beds to be able to communicate in ways that they couldn't before. So they could, they could have this uh, camera looking down at their body, and if they held up their left hand, it could call for food, and if they held up their right hand, it could call for help. So we could start creating projects that actually that do help and benefit other people uh, by using our, our machine learning platforms. It's still tracking me, so I'm going to get out of this. And I'm going to give you five minutes, uh, again, to work with the machine learning 2.0. So either do something with sound effects or do something with the uh, posing. And uh, hopefully some of you will have something to share when we come back in a couple of minutes. But I want to give you some experience with the 2.0 version of Teachable Machine uh, Learning also, even though it doesn't give you that the cool output feedback pieces at the end. Uh, so it's 2028. Uh, I'll give you till 2033. So either finish up your first Teachable Machine 1.0 or jump into this 2.0 and see what you can do with sound and gestures.
That's pretty cool. How long do you feel like it takes your kids to pick up on this and get to really kind of a complex project? Um, you know, they get this in one class. We do all of this uh, similar to how we're doing here. And then I usually give them a, a week to think about it and put together a proposal for a, a project. So I, I really want them to focus on how stuff like this can make the world a better place for themselves and others. So they're right. doing a lot of thinking right now about what are the problems with people that are socially isolated? And, and what are the problems with people that might be uh, unable to contact people when they need something? So they're, they're thinking and brainstorming a lot of cool ideas. Very cool. And this is in a, in a, what class are you teaching this in specifically? A design class or a? I teach this in a MYP digital design course and then also in a eighth grade technology foundations course. But looking at ways to, to integrate this in courses that I don't teach. Yeah, that would be, I mean, I'm sure you're going to do QA later, but I'm really curious as to how you kind of do this cross disciplinary. Like how can you work with an art teacher to come up with a project and, um, I can definitely see a lot of math and physics. Yeah, but I mean, this could even look at two maps and be able to identify uh, one country as it's looking at on a map. And so you could wire this into, I mean, virtually any, any subject matter. It just takes a little bit of creativity to think about, well, what problem could this solve inside of the, the subject matter that I'm trying to teach? Right. And can you, can you use an IoT device to, to, to do the same triggers? Or does it require a laptop with a browser type of thing? Like, could I use a Raspberry Pi with a, I guess you could use a Raspberry Pi with a browser or to- Yeah, I mean, you just need that camera input. Okay. So that could be on a, that could be on a Pi, that could be on uh, your phone, it could be on anything. You said you use this with MIP students. Do you feel like it could possibly be appropriate for fifth graders? Yeah, I do. I, I, think I, I think I would go as low as maybe even third grade with this. In third grade, it could be real basic. Can I tell these three Legos apart? It doesn't have to be anything sophisticated or baked into a, a larger curriculum or anything. If you just want to get the foot in the door a little bit on, on how this technology is starting to, to work, uh, this is a great foot in that door. actually started my spare machines uh, doing folding at home today. Mm. Have you been using doing that as well or not really? What is it? Folding at home. So using using your computer spare CPU cycles to, <laughs> to crunch ch crunch numbers. Yeah, I have seen that. <laughs> Apparently so many people are doing it right now <coughs> that it's more powerful than the top 500 supercomputers in the world. It's amazing. Processing power. <laughs> Which I remember cool. I remember in college, I used to leave my idle computers. I had three or four of them all running for the, the SETI project. Yeah. Just trying to Same crunch idea. all of that data. <laughs> but now we actually have a better purpose, I guess. <laughs> right. So I was going to say, my kids, my, my kids have had their computer running on some YouTube channel because they got some drop and got some free beta version of a game because they watched so much even though they weren't watching. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Not so altruistic. <laughs> uh, anybody get to a point where they've got a project they can show us? Can I ask how many poses should we have for the pose one? How many samples of each yeah. pose? Sorry. Uh, I, always, I always say try to get at least 100 samples. I don't know why, but my samples are going so slowly. Hmm. Like I've been waiting like crazy and I just have 20. Yeah, you know, and we've also got a machine learning program loaded in our browser that's using our camera while we're using yeah. our camera for Zoom. I mean, we, we might be mm -hmm. pushing the edge of where our <laughs> video processing can handle. Yours seem to go well. <laughs> just lucky, I think. <laughs> Yep, so my model went through and has trained. So if I close this out, I've got my my two poses. So it's able to tell if my left hand is up or my right hand is up. And this could be a cool project. I mean, again, you'd have to export this and uh, connect some outputs to it. But to be able to have people just hold their hands up and have a music start or to be able to do something creative and, and interesting 
uh, remotely could be really, really powerful with this. So right. if you export this, what are you going to export it to? This is where you would have options. And this is where the 2.0 kind of uh, leads you to your own devices. So you could export this model and it exports as a TensorFlow machine learning algorithm, but you'll then need to connect it to something that would drive outputs out of it. Uh, there's a little bit of information on that. Come back. So is that the hardest part is actually not this part of the creation, but the actual exporting and getting it. That's something else. Can come yeah, from. if you're going to build a, a standalone project. I think that uh, probably is that the, the next piece of it is uh, how do you connect it to other things. So okay. here's an Arduino that is able to sort things by those little pieces of candy, what they look like. Uh, there's a couple of other things where they've created this project where depending on if you're smiling or frowning or holding your eyes closed, it'll trigger things. Uh, can really so if you open up were, a bit of a rabbit hole. So if you were like a fifth or fourth grader doing this, what are they going to be able to do once they've finished? Fourth and fifth grade, I would focus with the 1.0 version of this yep. and uh, generate a, a working prototype of what a, a larger machine learning project would look like. Okay. Because you get your outputs from there, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. And at the very bottom of Teachable Machine, it describes it a little bit. That this is built in a way that it can plug into a, a variety of, of interfaces and displays. Okay. So that, whether that be a, a glitch website or an Arduino, uh, it's, it's really, really flexible and basically an open source teachable so, model. So version one, could you do poses in version one? I can't remember. Uh, you can. It's not... It's not creating the, the structure and, and kind of knowing the, the skeleton of what you're putting in there, but it would definitely know the difference between what this looks like and what this looks like. Okay. Well, I just thought of a really cool idea for elementary school teachers with this. What do you got? Well, uh, story time. So you can actually do like real magic where if you're telling a story and you hold up an object from the story, you can have sound or video actually start based on the <laughs> object you hold up. So characters in your story could kind of come to life and do things. That'd be really cool. For sure. Uh, you could create like a reverse Mad Libs project too, where you'd be telling a story and then they randomly hold one of the three objects up and the teachable machine places the word into the story maybe. Well, I'm just thinking about how, I don't know if you've been to Universal Studios where if you go to Harry Potter World, you could buy a wand and you go <laughs> to certain places and do it. You could absolutely do the same thing here, wait <laughs> in a certain way and, and do some magic. Right. <laughs> okay, that was good. All right, shall we move on just a little bit? Yep. All right, so the, the last part of this is, all right, well, based on what you've seen, based on what you know, based on what you're able to do, and quickly. Okay. Has anybody got any questions before we carry on, or do we want to carry on? Thumbs up to carry on, or raise your hand if you had a question. Or pizza cutter up, whichever, whatever you have. <laughs> okay, thumbs up, carrying on. <laughs> All right, we're good. All right, so our last part is this conversation about how do you connect this into doing something good for the world. That's really something I push all the time inside of technology is that, yeah, yeah, we're doing awesome stuff with VR and artificial intelligence, but are we uh, contributing to society? So uh, I'd like to hear from the, the group, if, if anything dawned on anybody, is there any projects outside of kind of the samples that I gave out that you thought of while we were working on this? And it's Aside okay. from my Harry Potter ideas. Well. <laughs> we love your oh, Harry Potter idea. So here's a project that I did with my eighth graders, uh, similar to what I've described. And I'll just play you this video of what I she created. So she used Teachable Machine 2.0 with the background noise. my background noise and then my other noise was me hitting different parts of my body against the floor like this and so I had designed it so that elderly people if they fell over the machine learning could sense it and then call the emergency services to make sure that they were okay it would definitely help them because I heard a bunch of stories of, like someone falls in their house and then like no one shows up for another three days and then they're just dead but in the recording you just saw I was hitting 
different parts of my body against the floor and it was generally picking up the more violent noises. So one thing that my students were thinking about um, when we were thinking about this together was uh, they were really concerned about hearing about all of the nursing homes and retirement facilities uh, that, that have nobody around that have been basically abandoned and, and how are people able to check in on some of our more vulnerable people in our population. And that was her idea of how she could at least be able to send a note to somebody that says, hey, check in on this person, a, a noise that has been trained to sound like what somebody falling on the floor has been triggered. Uh, can we check in on this person and see if they're okay? Uh, but it could be something a lot more simple. It could be a camera that's looking over a plate. And when it sees that all of the food is gone, it'll send a note to somebody to come and clean up the plates and sort of reduce the redundancy of uh, the, the workforce in our hospitals and in our retirement community that are stretched pretty thin. Uh, plenty of ideas where this could tie into. Um, or even be able to gesture away for people to communicate uh, for people that cannot speak. Uh, maybe they've got a ventilator attached to them and they, they literally cannot talk. Well, is there a way for them to communicate quickly and efficiently using something like machine learning? Yeah, for sure. So this is what my students are working on uh, this week during spring break, the big bulk of them. Uh, that is about the end of my deck. So we can take any questions or see anybody's examples or if anybody's brainstormed a way that they're going to introduce this with their students, uh, I'd love to hear it uh, either now or, or later when it, when it comes to you, once you've lived with this for a little bit. Uh, any questions? Not a question, but thank you, thank you for sharing this. This is super cool. And I think where I'm kind of at right now is we are just starting our grade five exhibition. Um, we're about a week into it. And so looking for ways that kids can feel like they can do something positive from home, that, that's a challenging part because so much of the exhibition is direct action, getting out into the community and, and being with people and they can't do that right now. So for me, I'm looking at my list of topics, um, the issues, and a couple of them naturally are around this, you know, the world situation at the moment. And I think this could have some really cool potential um, for giving them something that they feel like is an actionable thing, uh, a way that they can come up with an idea that actually could um, be really helpful. So I'm, yeah, like you said, I'm gonna sit with this a little bit, but I think this has a lot of really cool potential and I'm excited about it. And I think fifth grade, I mean, it's, they're gonna be so excited about it. It's gonna like, it's gonna blow their mind. I should say, so everyone here knows, Clint is so kind. He doesn't really know me, but I had an exhibition group last year who had artificial intelligence as a topic and he was so kind and talked with that exhibition group of kids to teach them um, and answer their questions about what is artificial intelligence, so. That was so much fun and it, it was mostly the student that I pulled along with me, but that's very kind. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, you've got your younger students who can work with this and if you get into eighth, ninth grade and they're looking for an MYP project or you're looking for an MYP design project to maybe fill in some gaps or, or get something going while we're distance learning, uh, my students, my ninth graders are absolutely going through the design cycle with this. So they've investigated what kinds of problems are occurring around the world with social distancing and the pandemic. They planned, here's a couple of ideas of how you might be able to solve that problem for other people and then actually creating it and then evaluating it uh, themselves and having other people testing it and poking holes in the problem. Uh, so you really do have a full uh, design cycle, all four criteria wrapped up into this project if you wanted to, to bake it out a little bit. Anybody else? How complicated have you seen this get? Because when, when you're doing the hand gesture, it was like, oh, you could almost do like something that translates sign language into text. Okay. Or, or <laughs> um, I had a student whose personal project were an IB school was to do something a little more sophisticated with this. And what he wanted to do, and he did it, was he trained it to know when a, he's a basketball player. And when he would shoot a basket, he wanted it to be able to tell if the basket was made or if the basket was missed. And his idea behind that was, all right, it's, it's cool and interesting to be able to blend his passion for basketball with technology and artificial intelligence. But he was really thinking about, well, where could this project 
take me if I went a little bit deeper? Like, could I use this to analyze gameplay? Could I use this to give uh, real-time data to basketball players to, to know where the weaknesses is of their opponents? So he was already thinking like that. I was like, how could we have cameras set up during a live basketball game that could give instant feedback to the coach as to uh, where most of the shots are being made or missed or how far away they are from uh, both our team and from the opposing team? So he was definitely thinking of, well, oh, how can I turn this into a, a much larger project? And that was very cool. I've got another student who, who's not using the machine learning part of this, but is using TensorFlow, which is the, the AI component that all this is baked into. And he built a project this year, so impressive. He uh, it did a machine learning where it ran the flights of, of uh, I think two dozen major international flights around the world. And he trained them to focus to learn not what was the best way to make money flying, but what had the lowest carbon footprints flying internationally. And as it went through, a couple hundred, 200, 300, a couple thousand, as it ran these simulations 5,000 times, it found a much better, more ethical way for planes to be flying internationally if they weren't focused on their algorithms generating income. So he had a really, really interesting personal project where he was able to show and demonstrate that international flights could be uh, better for the world. It was awesome. Anka, you have a question? Um, yeah, I did actually. Um, first, I just want to say that in, um, I'm not teaching a class right now, but we're looking at perhaps having a virtual um, summer camp. So mm -hmm. this um, teachable machine would be amazing actually. Um, use the stuff around the house if we're still in lockdown and uh, it's very in engaging. Um, thanks for sharing that app. Uh, secondly, I just wanted to say that at our school, we're, we're trying to expand on our offerings related to computer science and um, STEM. And I'm just wondering, something like the project you described with the grade nine um, boy, what kind of hardware do you need to be able to support that type of data processing? Is You're talking about the flight simulation project? Right. Yeah. He did all of that on his MacBook Air. And then when okay. he needed to do the, the final, final run to sort of render it all out, because it also, mm -hmm. all of these flights coming in, it was also moving very slowly as they were all recalibrating to use the, the least amount of fuel between all of the different connections they were making. So it ran really quite slow on his MacBook Air, but it did work. And then we rendered it out on a, a high-end MacBook Pro. Okay. But we just need that one high-end device at the very, very end to sort of crunch it all. Right. I guess that was just my question because we're right now replacing our arts department um, IMAX. And so I'm arguing for um, top of the line thinking, let's be able to support possible projects going forward. So right. you, you kind of do need a little, a, a stronger, what, what's the important part? Sorry, I know this is kind of maybe boring hardware questions, but What's the important part? <laughs> it kind of depends on what path you go down. Because if you're doing okay. this with Teachable Machine, it's, it's doing all of the crunching in the cloud. And I think okay. that's getting more and more common as, okay. as a way of sort of mining this sort of information. I think if you're talking about building out a technology department, you might even want to be considering going down the, the PC path if you want to start bringing in virtual reality platforms. Okay, that's a good point. Just because we are PC, except for our arts department. Hmm. So I was kind of hoping that their machines could double up. But what you're saying is you maybe want them separate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's probably a, a, a bigger conversation as to, to what no the problem. point is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Actually, I had a quick question. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just thinking about my students and the lovely GDPR world that we live in. Right. And I'm wondering, so if any of my students... I mean, I guess with grade five, I would stick with the version one, like you said, but I was thinking like that pose thing. And at a certain point, now we were able to do all that without setting up an account or putting a name or anything like that. But right. if you wanted to export it to something, would you need to set up an account or associate a name with it or anything like that? No, you can export it immediately. I mean, there may okay. be data privacy concerns in the data that's been collected where you've got students doing all of these poses and I mean, you wouldn't want all of that public and identifiable. 
Yeah. Uh, but as far as doing the training and exporting the data, uh, that's not connected to, to any student or any individual okay. until you start digging into that data. Oh, yeah. So, uh, thanks to Stephen. That reminds me. Oh, sorry. My husband stole my. <laughs> right. <laughs> so sorry. Sorry for the noise. And um, uh, I think first of all, this is direct links to language B, human ingenuity. So I have some students who unfortunately is in lockdown because they are in boarding school in Switzerland. Mm. So I'm thinking about this could be a very nice active idea if we build a interactive activity with them. And thanks to Stephen, I think, how, uh, is that strong enough that I could, with my students, to build a translator for the sign language? Um, I don't know that you, I mean, maybe, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know well, if there's a limit to how many different sets of data you can feed into it. I mean, with sign language, you're talking about thousands and thousands of, of, of micro gestures. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's certainly possible to do something like that with machine learning. I don't know if that's too heavy of a task for teachable machine with, with Google though. Maybe baby sign language. Yeah. Baby sign. Mm -hmm. Or maybe just concentrate on the letters or, or something. Okay. A yeah. little baby down. sign language is a good and uh, enjoyable idea. Yeah, it's a really awesome idea. I mean, thinking about what kinds of projects could come out of this with, with people with all kinds of disabilities. I know I had one student who just wanted to focus on being able to point their camera at a silverware drawer and, and if you were not able to see, to not accidentally grab the pointy end of a knife. I mean, and that was, that was the kind of investigation and planning that one of my students was doing, thinking about, well, how might this uh, assist uh, visually impaired people? And that's kind of awesome thinking that I, I like to promote. Uh, Gloke has got a, if I've said it rightly, a question. Yes, hi, how are you hi. everyone? Hey there. Um, Clint, how are you? Very well, how are you? Good, I'm good too. Um, good. I left Estonia, I'm in Greece right now. Um, so I actually missed the first part of your conversation, but um, it just happens that I'm the, I'm the mentor of a group this year and for their PYP exhibition, their topic is artificial intelligence. Mm. So, now, actually, with the lockdown, I'm also trying to, we're discussing ways of how to present all the research that has been done and everything that they've learned. Um, at some point, we looked into uh, Google experiments, um, AI, which are, were really good examples, actually, and they were interactive. I don't know if um, you're aware of them. Um, I could share a link here in the chat, but I was... Um, actually, I was thinking, I don't know if, if you'd be willing and interested, maybe we can Zoom with the kids and you can share some ideas, they can ask some questions, because now I'm trying to find, um, or if others are also interested, I'm trying to find people that we could um, interview online mm -hmm. and just um, discuss a few ideas and what they know, have the kids ask some questions and kind of make it more interactive for them. Yeah, I'd love to. For sure. So, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so far we've just, um, they've looked into the different applications of AI in different fields. And especially now with the whole situation happening, there's a huge interest of how um, of inter uh, artificial intelligence in, in medicine, in health, and uh, like 3D printing, masks, and there's a huge interest now around this area. Mm -hmm. So the situation has taken us towards this direction, actually. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering if there are any ideas, resources. Um, I was thinking if maybe we can now, because of the situation, if we could look more into the um, 
programming bit and actually see what an algorithm is and um, kind of try a few things out, maybe just using simple tools like uh, Scratch and just to get an idea of, you know, what it means to, to what, a, what an algorithm looks like and how it works. Yeah. To, get a to do something for us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where it kind of ties into like, what is artificial intelligence? And I, and I think that a lot of times we're thinking that uh, we're working on building an AI where there'll just be a single AI that, that can do everything. And I think where it's important to understand is that it's going to be more like having the apps on your phone. Where, yeah, you've got an app for this and you've got an app for that. I will almost certainly have an AI for this and an AI for that and an AI for that. So if you're able to compartmentalize these yeah. sort of smaller AI projects, it gives something uh, that students can do and something that's achievable and original and different and, and quirky and, and weird and, and, and great. Yeah, it's a, it's a great way to sort of kind of flip the classroom around a little bit as well because mm -hmm. I don't know what they're going to come up with. Yeah. Okay, that was my part. <laughs> Thanks. You're saying we're not going to live in the matrix? Is that what you're telling me? I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm operating under the assumption that we're already in simulation. <laughs> Are you really Clint? Aren't you? Or is it somebody else? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, if we are wrapped up. I've uh, dropped the link to my presentation in the chat of the Zoom meeting, as well as the, the links to the two teachable machine pieces. Uh, so you should be uh, ready to go, even if you need the back up a couple of steps and, and see the beginning of the presentation. Uh, but of course, my contact information is on the last slide. So if you need anything, even if that's just somebody to bounce an idea off of, um, of course, reach out. And I look forward to seeing your students' projects. Yeah, thank you so much, Clint. That was really, really pretty interesting. Um, really cool. I have a lot of ideas that I'm, I'm going to tell a lot of people tomorrow. So <laughs> yeah, it's a, it really gets the gears right turning a little bit, I know. Um, but we do want to, uh, we want to thank everybody for coming out this evening and um, want to remind you that we still have some other learning to threads coming up. We have a uh, Will is going to be talking about parenting and uh, how actually parenting, parenting through the situation changes your perspective on how, te how teaching and learning works. And I think it, but it's also being viewed as I'm a teacher and I'm also yeah. parenting. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you are, I stopped. <laughs> I haven't got any kids. <laughs> Steven, I have to look after Steven. Yeah, and I, I, I need that. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank have a good night. Bye. 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 See you.